Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If folks would take their seats, we're going to go ahead and get started today. I'm Peter Constantine, and I'm the Acting Deputy Chief Human Capital Officer. Welcome to what's going to be a really exciting two days. And at the start, I mentioned you can feel the energy, the excitement here. It does feel a bit like uh, a reunion. We've got folks here from the field. We've got folks from the headquarters, and I think we're going to have a really, really terrific uh, two-day conference followed by an amazing all-hands meeting. And um, you may have noticed in your materials, our theme for today is um, learning to lead and learning together. And so we've got some great courses planned for you. Um, and I thought about it, you know, I'm here on detail, and I was thinking about Ochico. When we talk about leadership, you really are the face of HUD. Um, you're the first to meet every new employee. You make that first impression on behalf of the department. When someone leaves, they're going to another agency or they're retiring, you are the last face they see at HUD. A person can work in PIH, never talk to somebody from FHEO. A person could go their whole time at HUD and never know what CPD does. Every employee touches Ochico. What you do matters so much, and the work you do blows me away, how hard people work. And so this is a chance to stop, learn, and really enjoy and build ourselves up as a body. It's also about fun, though. You know, we talk about family reunion. Here's a chance to encourage you during the break. If you're a new person, here's your chance to say, you know, introduce yourself, um, talk to somebody. If you haven't seen anybody in a while, here's a chance to chat. Here's a chance I've already had somebody say, hey, over break, I want to talk to you about a particular issue. Use this time. It really is a chance for fellowship. It's a chance to really grow as an organization, and really it's a time to enjoy ourselves. A few housekeeping things, though. Um, please remember, if you're like me, you know, you always have the cell phone, take a moment. You know, my kid's going to probably call me at some point, Dad, I lost my homework. I don't want the, the uh, ringer going off. Take a moment, turn it to silent or vibrate. We have a super jam-packed agenda for you for the next two weeks. Um, two weeks, good Lord, two days. <laughs> two, so much we have packed two weeks in two days. Um, Take a moment to look at it, and the reason I'm saying you will see that it's rare we're all together. There are different sessions for different folks. So um, after this, some, for example, some folks will be going down to the basement training room. Other folks will be staying here. So you definitely want to take a look at the agenda. If you're not sure, if you're like, hey, I don't know where the basement is. I, I just, I'm new to HUD. Or if you're not sure where I'm to go, ask anybody, but please pay attention. We'll be moving around a lot today, which actually is kind of nice. You won't be sitting at the same table, same room for two days straight. Um, it's also a chance, again, during the presentations or after, please ask questions. This is a great opportunity. I am blown away by some of the speakers we have You're from OPM, other places, the leadership. Here's a chance when you see somebody, hey, I'd like to ask you about this or that. Um, and also, evaluations. You will see in the packet of material, there's an evaluation for uh, each session. Um, we'll collect those at the end of tomorrow. So if you like, you could fill it out as you go along, if while it's fresh in your mind. But at the end of the day tomorrow, we will collect it because I've learned from Dr. Sheila Wright, we love feedback, we love course evaluations. So I'd like to now introduce our first speaker for uh, this morning. Laura Hogshead serves as HUD's Chief Operating Officer. And she has worked on the Hill, she has worked at HUD. And when I thought about introducing Laura, the word that came to mind is passionate. She is passionate about what HUD does, its mission. She cares an incredible amount about the work of Ochico. You may never see her name, but trust me, she is the behind the scenes person who makes things happen. So um, she comes to us from the Deputy Secretary's office this morning, and I'm gonna turn it over to Laura to share a few words. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. That was lovely. Good morning. This is, such, this is such a vibrant room. I could hear you guys coming through the front door. I could hear the, the uh, excitement that was going on in Brook Mondale. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm here on behalf of Nani Coloretti, and I wanted to welcome you to the conference. As Peter said, I'm HUD's Chief Operations Officer, and I'm very excited to join you, both the folks in the room who are full of excitement, and I'm sure those who are watching in their field offices are just as full of excitement. I wish they could share this with us in this room. So I want to thank Tawanda, first of all, for pulling this together and for her phenomenal leadership. She is working to build HUD a stronger organization every day, and I want to take a moment to give her a round of applause. I 
also want to thank the rest of the Ochico team. I don't know everybody's name, but I know the folks who have been scurrying around making this happen over the last few weeks have worked really hard to pull this together, and I think it's a phenomenal opportunity for all of us. So I want to take a moment for us to acknowledge them as well. So as you've heard, this year's conference is focused on learning to lead. And I know that from a look at the rest of the conference agenda, you're going to leave here with a renewed sense of passion and purpose, and I'm excited about that. And I also want to take a moment just to reflect back on the importance of Ochico's work to the entire agency. So Ochico works to deliver the services that enable HUD's human capital to fulfill the department's mission. So that's a mouthful. The easier way to say it is that Ochico's mission is HUD's mission. You all carry out the important work of HUD every day. We couldn't do it without you. The rest of the agency doesn't exist without you. And I want to really thank you and have you think about that over the next couple days. Because what you do is you end homelessness. And you provide FHA mortgages. And you do all of the other amazing things that HUD does. It starts here. So I want to make sure that you know that Secretary Castro and Deputy Secretary Colorado stand behind you in this work. They're ready to help in any way. I know the Secretary and the Deputy Secretary have worked on deep dive projects with you. You guys might have heard way too much about these. Several of you are involved in these projects. So the, the priority to build a stronger HUD starts here. And that starts with streamlining hiring, improving customer service, improving supervisor training. We're, we're working with Dr. Sheila Wright on that. Enhancing customer service again and making sure that we have an SES candidate development pipeline. There are all kinds of projects going on in addition to the work that you do every day. So streamlining the POL process. You guys are all familiar with the POL now. That started with a team from Ochico and we're very grateful that you are lending all your best people to think about these problems in a new way. And I want to challenge you over the next couple of days to continue to think about problems in a new way, to continue to ask why do we do it this way? Could we do it differently? What is a better way to approach this problem? So I know in the planning of this conference, we intended to use it as an opportunity to share knowledge, to share experience, and to share best practices. You're going to hear from OPM. You're going to hear from other folks. I want you to take a moment. This is a great opportunity to think about all of those best practices, think about the new ways to do things, and take it back to your work. And I just want to thank you for the close partnership that we have. I know I email a lot of you a lot. So you've, you definitely have seen my name in your email inbox when I'm asking for this or that or the other. I want to thank you for your constant professionalism and your responsiveness, and I look forward to the continued partnership. So I look forward to great things, to hearing good things out of this conference, and I want to turn it back to Peter. Thank you. Terrific. And now I'm so excited to introduce, really, uh, a lady who needs no introduction. and. Uh, that is Tawanda Brooks, who we all know is the Chief Human Capital Officer. And if you look in your packet, we have folks' bios, and you, know, you read Tawanda's, and it really is amazing. You know, she has been with HUD since 2009. Before becoming the Chico, she served as a Deputy uh, Chief Human Capital Officer. She served with a variety of agencies, Commerce, Energy, Homeland Security, Library of Congress, Agriculture. If it involves HR human capital, Tawanda's touched it. She has degrees from George Mason and also my alma mater, American University. And again, in doing these introductions, I was thinking, is there a word that, that you know, describes a particular person? And with Tawanda, the word that kept coming up was vision, visionary. You know, she handles the day-to-day -day operations of Ochico, but if you spend some time with her, I think you'll see that this week. She has a vision for HUD, for Ochico, for how we deliver our human capital services. Always thinking the big picture. And it amazes me, she has the ability to come from the mountaintop, 10,000 feet, but bring it down to where we are in the weeds, down to the valley where the work gets done. And so I am proud to be working with her, and I'm proud to introduce Tawanda Brooks. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our first annual Human Capital Conference. I'm so excited that all of you are here. I'm so excited to be able to see your faces in person, to be able to just be here in front of you and to say thank you for coming, thank you for participating, and thank you for making this happen. Um, it's so exciting to have you here and for all of us to be in the same room and for you to be able to participate in this conference. It's just so important for us to have this opportunity to build on our competencies, for us to be together, to be able to talk with one another, to be able to share in this experience, and for us to be able to just just experience this together. I want to um, first and foremost say thank you to the work that was done um, 
before we were all able to actually be in this room. Um, the team that pulled this together did a lot of planning and preparation, talking, phone calls, um, email messages, scrambling, um, just preparation. Um, just, just a lot of work, and, uh, and they did it for all of us, and they did it because they wanted to do it, and they did it because they have a passion for us, they have a passion for the work, and they just have a passion for just, you know, just us. And I think um, we have to just give them a standing ovation, and those people are um, the, um, the executive sponsor, Joe Smith. The project manager, Juliet Middleton. Um, the team, Bessie McGallion Williams, Robin Johnson, Sharon Lacey, John Manos, Ivelisse Bibi Supovita, Andrea Hodge, Lisa Maple Williams, Paula Lopez, Connie Lovato, Peter Constantine, and Jim Fruge. You know, there were evenings that um, Andrea Hodge called me um, on my cell phone on my way home um, in the evenings to kind of make sure she was on the right track and making sure that she was making the right phone calls and having the right conversations. And I just want to say thank you and just give the team just, you know, a, a special thanks for making this happen because I just um, had a vision and really wanted to make sure that we had this opportunity. Um, we did this on a, a, a very small, so zero budget, <laughs> and you know, uh, just making phone calls. And I wanted to make sure that we had OPM to come in and talk to us, and and, and have some conferences on, you know, um, have some specialists here from OPM to do this. Um, have our experts within Ochico, and just have topics that you wanted, and things that I wanted, and just overall to make this happen. So thank you. And on Thursday, we're going to have an all-hands meeting, some recognition. So please give us your insight on um, if this is the kind of thing that we need to do again, and the topics, if they're the right topics, if there are other things um, that you want to do. So please give us your um, comments, your insight, and, um, and, and let's just have fun this week. Thank you. Awesome, thanks Tawanda. So you're probably thinking, we've got this illustrious group up here, what are they doing, and who are they? Um, and I'm going to introduce our next segment, we, it is Ask the, uh, the title is Panel and Ask the Leadership. So um, Mike Stein, the Deputy Director for ELRD, is going to be facilitating that. And the folks, if you don't know them, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go right in order of the table, if you want to raise your hand, we've got Jean Lin Pao, who is our Chief Management Officer. And Jean recently came to us from PDNR. We've got Felicia Purifoy, who is the director of the Office of Human Capital Services. And God bless her, she's under the weather, said this is important, I will be here no matter what. So give her a tissue if you see her, make sure she's feeling better. <laughs> Joe Smith, who serves as our chief performance officer. And ask when you have a break, ask Joe about his wonderful family or stop by his office. Not only is he an amazing member of the SES, he has a, a tremendous family, lots of grandkids. Uh, Dr. Sheila Wright, who serves as our Chief Learning Officer, and anytime we have the word learning or training, all paths lead to Sheila. And we also have up there Jack Malgeri, who is in the immediate office of the uh, Chief Human Capital Officer, who works on all sorts of projects, the things that are tough to tackle. And I think we've gotten everybody, we all know Tawanda. So Mike Stein, come on up. He is going to facilitate this discussion and a chance to have a little Q&A with senior leadership. Mike. Thank you, Peter. So I want to start off by thanking those who um, um, sent in questions. We have about a dozen questions, and um, they're very, very good. And so we're going to throw them immediately to the panel. And we'll start off with Jean for question number one. Um, please tell us about your very first job and what you learned from it. Well, thanks, Mike. Um, and thank you for the question. Actually, upon reflecting um, on this question, I came to the conclusion I've been at HUD for 
quarter of a century. Uh, <laughs> when I think of it that way, it's really daunting. <laughs> so when I first came to HUD, uh, my first job at, was a social science analyst in the Office of Policy Development and Research. And I was in the Division of Program Evaluation. And back then, um, Secretary Jack Kemp was our secretary. And his signature programs were the um, Homeownership for People Everywhere, HOPE, HOPE programs. And my first assignment was to lead the evaluation of the HOPE One program. That's Homeownership um, in Public Housing. And it took me over a year to get that uh, contract evaluation awarded. And um, I had worked really hard um, to complete that assignment and very excited um, to get that research started. Well, there was a change in administration and of course change in priorities. And the decision of then um, Assistant Secretary for PDNR, um, they decided to terminate that evaluation. And so personally, I had thought, you know, that was a real setback for me. And um, also, I had to figure out, well, what do I want to do next? Um, that was my main portfolio. Well, I'm glad I had stuck it out. I had um, been very receptive to special projects, and back then we had a lot of um, new initiatives, such as uh, reinventing HUD, um, the customer service um, task force. I also worked on, back then, we had the Nor Northridge earthquake, and so I was tasked with, well, how do we prepare for the next big one? So I had those special projects, and um, they really served me well. And I want to really call out, in terms of the uh, reinventing task force, HUD, HUD task force, I got to meet and work with a lot of senior people in the building. It wasn't necessarily program evaluation, research policy development, but um, it was a special project. It really opened a lot of new doors for me. I even got to meet Joe Smith back then. <laughs> um, but really to say that um, in the face of adversity comes opportunity. And if I didn't stick it out, and if I didn't say yes to new assignments out of my comfort zone, I wouldn't be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. So our second question is for Felicia. Um, as the HR Director of Human Capital Services, what are the most pressing challenges you deal with on a regular basis? And explain why. Hi, everybody. Welcome. So um, I'm sorry, what was my question? No, I see it. <laughs> I'd say the most pressing challenges. First of all, I've been here since August of 2014. And as many of you probably know, when you come into a new department, you have to learn not just the people, but you have to learn processes, union agreements, you know, how does it flow, how is it supposed to flow, those types of things. And, and I can tell you right now I'm at a point where I think I have, um, I won't say mastered, but I have a pretty good understanding now of how the department um, is functioning and ways of improving that. I'd say the biggest challenge for me now is transition to new ways of doing business. For example, as Laura mentioned earlier about the hiring process and the position organizational listing, which used to be called the hiring plan, that is a taking um, on itself with respect to the department getting used to a new way of doing business. So for me, it's when we have these new ideas and great recommendations, it's selling our customers so that they understand it is a win-win for them and value added to the work that they do in helping them accomplish their mission as well. Um, that means repeated hand-holding. It means repeated conversations over stuff that you said before. But you know what? I don't give up or, or lose patience on those folks because it's something that they're not understanding. I mean, you have those that don't want to understand, but then the majority do want to understand. So I have to take it upon myself with my staff, with the leadership that supports me and making sure that folks understand that this is the way that HUD is going to go um, and this is the best way for us to be more efficient in the day-to-day -day work that we do. Thank you, Felicia. The um, third question is for Tawanda. 
The question is, why aren't the HR conferences ever held in a field location? Well, this is our first one, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's our first one. So I think that's the first thing. I, and maybe after we're after we figure this one out, we can talk about how we plan the next one. Um, our budget is tight, and we have to figure out how we manage with the budget that we have. So as we start to plan better and we think about how we, um, what we need, what training do we need next time around, how do we plan it, maybe we can figure something out for the next go around. And since we're actually um, going to the model of the HR business partner and we're gonna do that in cohorts and um, um, we're doing some other uh, looking at the organization, uh, we're, looking, we're doing an assessment of ELR, we're doing some other business pro um, process improvement, um, things within um, reasonable accommodation is one. We're gonna do one within the security office. So um, after we do those, as we're planning for next year, the training, and um, hopefully we'll do another conference in 17, uh, maybe we can think about how we plan for a conference um, somewhere else and, and where will we do that. So if you have ideas, well, let's think about that. Thank you, thank you, Tawan. Our fourth question, I'm gonna throw it open to the panel. Uh, it's a very interesting question. Um, do you think people are born leaders or is it a skill that can be taught? Of the two, which type of leader is more effective? The born leader or the leader that, that acquires that skill? So who on the panel would like to tackle this, this question? <laughs> Jack, thank you. I, um, I, I think that there are certain individuals in this world who have had the advantage of having the intellect, the attributes to be born leaders. Um, I, I think for the most part, though, uh, leaders can be developed um, and they can be um, ob obtain the skills necessary to, to be quite effective, even though they may not initially have those uh, th th those those qualities. Um, I, I think that the, the fundamental things about leadership, um, effective leadership, starts with honesty. And then it be, it, it, you add treating people um, with fairness and equality. And if you can do those things, you will be a successful leader. Those are personal attributes, but I think it's something that you, you learn and that you can, over time, develop and practice. Um, so I, I, I do think that leadership definitely is an acquired um, an acquired art and, and, and skill. Thank you, Jack, thank you. Okay, so the next question is for Tawanda. Um, as the Chico, what are the most important decisions you face daily leading our organization at HUD? I actually prepared an answer for that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, I think about the people we impact each and every day, inside and outside of HUD. Um, our employees need to be paid timely, and our citizens need homes, whether they are homeless, veterans, or teens. I think about the accuracy of our data because everyone relies on our data. I think about the new PLL process and um, deploying Cornerstone. I think about SEC, and our departing employees, I think about the poor family that just lost their mom and how well the EAP services have helped them. I think about the backlog of personnel suitability cases and how EVS is right around the corner. Uh, with the limited funds, how do I maximize the use of funds and, fairly, and how fairly we reward our team efforts and how we, how, um, how we hire the right people with the right skills um, in the organization. I think about these things every single day because um, 
we are the people that do all of these things each and every day. We manage the union uh, relationships. We handle everything. We do retirements for people. We handle their business. We manage their data. We do everything for them. We have control of this information, this sensitive information. And if we don't handle it correctly, we could ruin their lives. We could ruin this their lives, we could put their lives in jeopardy. So if we don't take care of this information and hold it confidentially, we could mess their lives up. So if we don't do it right, we could, we could mess up. So for me, that I have to, I hold that very dearly and I wanna do it right. So I take my job extremely seriously and um, we gotta get it right. So. I, I think about that every single day, and I want to do my job right every single day, and I want to make sure that we put things in place to do it right. So if that means, you know, getting training right, if that means, you know, um, me working late to get things right so that I can, you know, do something for you or do something for, for Felicia or answer a question or get things done, I'm going to do that. I'm gonna make the right decision. If I have to sit there five extra minutes to make the right decision, I'm gonna do that. If I have to take an extra class and, and make the right leadership decision, I'm gonna do it. Um, so I take all of that um, very seriously. So I, um, I, ha I believe in continual learning and I just believe in all of that. So um, yeah. Thank you, Tawanda. Does Thank that you. make sense? Yeah, I, I take it all very <laughs> seriously. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give this next question to Joe. Okay, Joe. <laughs> what did your parents do? How did they influence you as um, the leader you are today? Your parents. Oh. <laughs> my response is sort of simple. In my head, I hear my mama saying. If there's a will, there's a way. If there's a will, there's a way. The other one is God never going to give you more burdens than you can bear. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. So as a foundation, the other one is really my father. Uh, my mother was a beautician. My father was a baker. And I can remember when my sister, I'm the oldest of six, just so you know, OK? six, uh, five boys and one girl. So you understand, <laughs> my sister, she was, she was graduating from Fish University and I'll never forget, we went on a trip there, all the family met, et cetera. And my baby came, my, I'm sorry, my sister came down and she uh, put her arms around and hugged my father. And my father started crying, but then he laid his hand out, and the bunions, what happened as a baker, he, he worked for Fowl Flowers Baking Company, which down south is a pretty good, big place, all right? But he had to take the ovens out, I mean the pans out of the oven. On his hands were all of the bunions of the years at which he had done that. But his greatest reward was she graduated from Fisk, and he was proud of that. And he told us the story as we sat around at lunch one day. They wanted to move him up or to promote him into management. My father said, no, just managing these six kids is enough. <laughs> so he didn't want to go there. So for me in my life, what it is is that I always remember that, you know, when there's a will, there's a way. And I'm a firm believer. I understand what that will is. And I work and pray each and every day because they became the model. And I was taught to walk in his will and everything else will take care of itself. So we learn that whatever you conceive, if you believe in it, all right, then you can achieve it because you already have the source. 
and you are a reflection of what is within you. And if you are not productive, then what is in you is not real, okay? Uh, I don't know if I should have been the one to answer that question. <laughs> no, thank you, but I, you know, I think that's just a an amazing story and very inspirational. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question is for Tawanda. How do you maintain your daily motivation and inspiration despite obstacles and pushback? <laughs> Any tips for us? Um, I want to be here. Um, I choose to lead myself every day. Uh, it's a thing that you have to want to do. You can't allow anyone else to do that for you. Um, you can't allow anyone to make you feel something that you don't want to feel. You have to be self-motivated. You have to want to do. And um, yeah, um, you have to have something within you to motivate you. You have to want to do this work. You have to want to serve. You have to understand the Constitution and why we're here as civil servants and em employees. You can't um, allow the federal salary to be your motivation. It has to be the work. It has to be um, the Constitution and the civil servant uh, mentality that keeps you here. As um, and, and the HUD mission has to be why we're here. You have to understand really um, the goals of the federal government and, and really understand what it means to be a federal employee. Um, and I think that has to really be ingrained in you um, to be a successful federal employee. At some point, you really need to understand that aspect of it. And I think once you do and you're, you're settled in that feeling of being a federal employee and you understand your role and your responsibility and you understand why you're here, the other things don't really bother you anymore. And you can, you can, you, you can start to really build your career. You can start to build what you need to do. And I think um, uh, HUD is a, a really special place because um, employees here, the morale is, um, the morale has impacted our ability to um, really move forward. Um, if you look at EVS and you look at um, previous EVS, um, it has impacted our ability to really take this organization where it really needs to go. And um, if we really go back to really what the mission of this organization is and the um, superior mission of what we really do, and if we concentrate on that and what the Department of Opportunity, and if we all really think about that, we can take this organization so far. And we've started to do that. And we've started to really concentrate on that and concentrate on what we need to really do. Um, and that's what I'm doing. I refuse to really think about all of the other stuff. And we are thinking about what we want to do, these 10 projects, um, what, are, what we're going forward. Let's think about what we want to do for the future. Let's think about that and what we need to do and, and concentrate on that. That's what I'm doing and I, I know what I'd like to see the organization and I'm trying to listen to what you want and that's my concentration is on that. So that's how I stay motivated. Thank you, thank you. Um, Sheila, if you would take the next question, please. What is the most important characteristic a leader should have and why? I was hoping for one of the other questions. This is the harder one. <laughs> this one's hard. This one's um, <laughs> I think at the end of the day, your integrity um, is all you have. Um, that's the legacy you leave. And working as best as you can to be fair uh, are, the, are the things that I think a leader um, must maintain at all times. There are going to be uncomfortable situations that you find yourself in. Um, um, in school, we used to say, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be consistent. And all of that's wrapped up in, 
um, integrity. There are some things um, that we go through as leaders that, um, again, put you in a difficult spot. Um, ethically, in some instances, either, even, you know, in some ways advising when it comes to the law or the statute. All you have at the end of the day is your word and your integrity. That's the only thing that you have is your word and your integrity. Thank you. Thank you. So um, next question is back to Tawanda. Uh, it's it's um, a question on the training budget. Why is the training budget per year for each HR specialist so low? And the, um, the, um, the questioner said, I heard it was around $500. We can get a good USDA course for that amount. The $500 is accurate. Um, our overall budget, we have an overall budget, and if you divide the number of people within Ochico, it rounds out to about $500. Um, so that's, that's it, yeah. <laughs> In addition, uh, we do have access to some other HUD Learn resources. Um, we have HVU, there's some courseware that's, um, that doesn't cost us any money. But if you think about over the last couple of years, HRU. I'm sorry, HR, oh yeah, and HVU and then HRU, there's some courses on HRU that you can get online that don't cost, um, that don't cost money. So if you get on HRU, please um, look on there, and OPM has been updating courses on there for, um, for us, uh, for you to be able to take, so please get online to do that. Um, Sheila and I are also serving on the executive, uh, on the executive steering committee to, um, uh, to update courses for the 201 series. Um, so, in, in addition, there are some other courses on there as well. So, please stay updated and look on on, on HRU for courseware. Um, and we've been trying to bring in um, courses for uh, just overall courses with um, within HUD um, to for you to take. There have been book series, leadership courses um, that you can. Uh, take here. So there are a lot of courses that you can actually um, take. So please make sure that you're doing those. So there are some opportunities for you. And I can vouch for that. I just finished the mandatory trainings, the five. And when I went in, <laughs> I went in and I said, what else is, is oh, yeah. in this library? And yeah. there's some tremendous, there's some terrific courses mm -hmm. and they're all free. Yep. So, you know, it's, there are, you know, those things available. On a related note, Tawanda, uh, the, there's another question. What is being done to increase so we can stay up to date in our respective fields? Yeah, I just kind of addressed some of that um, with the mm -hmm. HRU. There's some courseware. We also offered some um, courses over the last couple of years. We've done some, we've done suites of training for um, to for um, the HR specialists. We're trying to do some other things um, too. If you um, talk to your directors within your organization, if there are courses that you want to take, please talk to your directors and we'll try to get some of those done. Um, they're presenting courses to us so that we can talk as an organization to try to bring um, together and try to get some of those done. Mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. You can do that. <laughs> please. Um, so you guys, um, this year is a little bit different. Um, normally, in the past, you were able to complete a SF-182, submit it to your supervisor, and go um, and do great things in training land. Um, this year is different. The training procurement policy has changed, and we've been pretty much forced, because of um, BFS, um, and the shared service on the CPO and CFO side to change the way procurement um, takes place in the agency. So basically what that means is that for those individuals that want to take um, or participate in a training activity, depending on the cost of the activity, could take a long time to process. So if, it's, if you're training, if you're submitting a training request, and it's under $3,500, then we can um, pay for that via the um, purchase card. 
If it is over $3,500, which many of you, a few of you have submitted training that's over $3,500, we would, um, HUD Learn would have to complete uh, work with you to complete a government cost estimate of three vendors so you can no longer choose your vendor and it would have to go into the PRISM system so for those of you that don't know PRISM is the department's procurement system and that can take anywhere from 30 or as long as 120 days so the whole process and, and you can talk to any person on the learn team and they can tell you how that has exponentially added to the processing time for learning activities. So um, I just wanted to make you aware of that so you're not thinking that in some way your requests aren't moving forward once they get to your supervisor. Um, this is something the department in Tawanda can tell you and share with you. This is something the department as a whole is doing and our program offices are having some of the same challenges and concerns as we are. Courses that we would normally have out by the end of second quarter, we're not even, we're hoping to be able to get them out by the, um, what, fourth quarter? Um, I know Trevor's been working a lot with that. Um, I think Trevor's in the back, and he can personally attest to you that right now a lot of our actions are sitting in prison for processing. So that, that is the hand that we've been dealt. We've asked you, asked you to be patient and work with you actually to try to find um, easier ways to maneuver through that, like HRU, like participating with other agencies to see if they have spaces available where you can attend mm -hmm. at no cost. That's the easiest way and the fastest way to get you the learning opportunity. Thank you, Sheila, thank you. So as, as a former uh, work-life balance manager for the Navy, I love this next question, and I'm gonna open it up for the panel. Describe your career progression and how you balance work life and family time. Uh, who would like to take the career progression, being in the SES, and balancing the important work life, family? Um, let's open it up to the panel. <laughs> Who would like to take that question? Thank you, Jane. <laughs> I'll just kick it off. So um, that's a really good question. And actually, when I was considering to take my first management position, I, I was very reluctant because my, my children then were very small. And one of my mentors here at HUD, <laughs> she, she said, take a look, take a look at that um, HUD HUD exit going into L'Enfant Plaza. And um, check out how many managers are leaving at like five o'clock on the dot. <laughs> and so that, was, um, so that was a reality check in terms of, you know, it takes personal discipline in terms of um, getting your job done within your tour of duty and really make that discipline and separation of work life and balance it with your personal life. So um, that helped me. Also, in terms of consulting some other more experienced managers, um, fortunate to be working in a technologically you know, advanced environment. So if there's some things that don't get done during the day, I could always do it remotely. Um, so that's another, that's another advantage. But, the end result is really, um, you know, a supportive um, supervisor. Everything's negotiable. I mean, in my experience, <laughs> um, was able to, um, you know, work within uh, that type of um, in, you know, environment. Always find a, a supportive supervisor, um, and really uh, managing self. That that does take a lot of discipline. Thank you, Jean. Anyone else at the panel would like to add to that? I'm going to try this one. <laughs> um, I'm on the other side, <laughs> if, you, if you understand. Uh, I'm on the other side in the context that I've come through. The reason I ended up coming into government was because my son was born. All right? I was outside running an operation with about 75 law school students and two or three lawyers. 
and I was flying across the country doing a lot of things with the legal services operations. And the bottom line is I walked into a place and I was told, hey, you aren't going to make it to C30. Okay. Well, the biggest thing that I was concerned about was I want to live to see my son grow up. Well, he's 49. I got a bunch of grandchildren from him, et cetera. Okay. But what happens is in terms of work life, it becomes an issue of defining the priorities. And the priority order becomes family first, all right? Work second, all right? And in, you make a decision about delivering, all right? You have to deliver to your family first because they're the reason. Then, in terms of your work, you want the quality of your work to be of such a nature that your family would respect what you're doing when you're away from them. <laughs> okay? So it becomes a daily exercise in terms of uh, choosing. And nowadays, I'm going to be honest with you, you all got some flexibilities we didn't have. I mean, I can remember doing the midnight all, but I couldn't come right into the, the terminals here and hook up and continue to do my work. So it becomes, number one, making some very fundamental decisions in terms of what's the priority? Family first. Number two, at the job, and I, I sort of want to tap onto what Sheila said about integrity in terms of the work. Mm -hmm. And number three, you, in terms of the quality of your life, balancing it out. And of course, with, with what we have nowadays in terms of your sitting down with your supervisors and having some understandings about these things, it becomes important that you sit down and have a discussion, that you talk and you're very clear. There are some things that are priority. Now, I'm gonna make sure that I meet all my goals, et cetera, but if I have illness to my son, if I have whatever challenges, I gotta go. So that, that, those, in, those, in that order, in that understanding, I think, becomes very, very important in terms of the nature of your work relationship. And, and when I say work relationship, I wanna be very clear. Your relationship with your supervisor, because they, they have to know, for instance, they have to know no matter what happens in terms of hitting that deadline, if my people say they got it, they got it, okay? And they understand that. But we also know that if something comes up with that child, I'm gone, <laughs> okay? So I- Thank I, you, <laughs> thank you, thank you. And we have one more question. And this last question is for Tawanda. As a senior executive, what are the most useful resources you would recommend to someone looking to gain a better perspective into becoming a better leader? The most useful resources to becoming a better leader. Write everything down. Listen more than you speak. Get a coach. Get a coach. Yes. Monitor the behavior of other leaders. Understand engagement, understand engagement. Look at data. If you're in an organization, understand the data that's around you. Know what that data is. Um, yeah, it says a lot if you understand the data, but get a coach. <laughs> if they're free, um, get a coach. If they're not free, figure out how to get a coach. <laughs> Get, but get a goat. <laughs> Thank you. It, get a, yeah, get get a, a coach. coach. <laughs> it helps. Um, yeah, it, get a coach. <laughs> I want to give a, a hearty thank you to our panel members, to those who asked these questions, and um, enjoy the conference. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks.
folks, if you look at your agenda, we have a, a slight break. Um, we'll be reconvening at 10.15. And please look, next we'll be actually splitting up. Managers, uh, you will be heading down to uh, B178, one of the training rooms. We have a great workshop uh, on leadership, knowledge, and management from OPM. Um, the rest of us, we will be reconvening back here for a great presentation by Liz Joyce from CEB Enterprises talking about strategic alignment of our priorities and goals. So grab a quick cup of coffee. Um, if you're not sure where you're headed, give somebody a holler, but we will reconvene promptly at 10.15. Thanks.